morning, Jesus Image Church. Can we give a praise to Jesus this morning? Welcome all those that are watching online. Let's just go ahead and look to Jesus, the Lamb of God. And I'm going to read scripture. Genesis 18 verse 1 says, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. And he looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. So Jesus, we ask you, if it pleases you, that you would not only rest here for a while, but dwell within us forever that you would wait until we bring our worship and our praise and that we would wash your feet with our tears and our oil this morning. Oh Lord, we ask you that you would be elevated and enthroned, be enthroned in our hearts, be enthroned in our praise and in our worship. We ask you to rest in the shade of our praise this morning. We come lowly and we would be willing to be nothing that today Christ and Christ crucified would be everything. We pray this in your beautiful name, Jesus. Amen.
You're all 
Say. 
rise Day and night, night and day Let incense rise Day and night, night and day Let incense rise Day and night, night and day Let incense rise Day and night Night and day, let it since rise. Day and night, night and day, let it since rise. Day and night, night and day, let it since rise. Day and night, night and day, let the glory. 
glory for from you are all things to you are all things you deserve the glory you deserve the glory you deserve the glory You deserve the glory. You deserve the glory, Lord.
just raise your voices. There's no one like the Lord. Oh, there's no one like the Lord. Oh, just tell him there's nobody like him. There's no one like you, Lord. Oh, nobody comes close.
We welcome you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Jesus, move and have your way today. Precious Jesus, we welcome you to come and inhabit the praises of your people this morning, Father. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We'll never get tired of telling you how much we love you. We love you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place, into our life. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, beautiful Jesus. Move on the hearts of your people, Lord. Fill them afresh, Jesus, with your spirit right now. Touch them, Jesus. Quench the thirst in our hearts, Father. Quench the thirst, Jesus. Make all things new, Jesus. You make all things new. You take the broken and you restore, Jesus. You restore all things. You redeem lost time, Lord, because you are the redeemer, Lord. You are the redeemer. And we welcome you to move. We won't put limitations on you, Holy Spirit. We worship you, precious Jesus, beautiful King, anointed one, splendid in all of your ways, beautiful Savior, everlasting King. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we just give the Lord a shout this morning? quick, you guys can be seated. Before I dismiss our worship team, someone just turned 45 a few days ago, and we want to sing him happy birthday. So you got to come up here. Come on, we have a cake. You have to blow out your candles. Judy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Michael. Happy birthday to you. Wow. All right, you guys can be seated. Worship team, let the worship team know how much you love them. All right, it's offering time. There you go. All right, if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Me and Michael have known each other for 20 years. Can you believe that? And our 18th wedding anniversary is coming up. Wow. We are getting old, guys, but we're trying to stay young. Hallelujah. All right. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. It says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. Listen to this. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of all of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of believers in Jerusalem. Let's go to verse six. So we urge Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. See, giving is so much more than what we think. If there is a ministry of giving and generosity, may we be these people, Lord. Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, 
your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. Just want you to think for a moment. As you know, it was Michael's birthday and there's this, this person that every year, all the time that he can, he always just is so generous. And he gave Michael a gift and wrote this beautiful card. And I said to Michael, I said, this person has always been so generous. See, when you're a generous giver, people notice. And when you're generous, the Lord notice it, notices that. You also notice stingy people that never give anything away as well. And we want to be a Jesus people that are generous. Amen? We want to be the kind of people that are known by our generosity because everything we have belongs to the Lord, right? Everything we have is His. So let's just pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we get to give to you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we get to worship you in everything we do, Lord, every part of us, Lord, and in the act of generosity, Jesus. It is our joy to give to you, Lord, because you gave your life for us on the cross, Jesus. You held nothing back from us, and we are so thankful for that. So we love you today, Lord Jesus, and bless your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's many ways to give. If you need an envelope, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will come and give you an envelope. Keep it up high. And also, if you're watching online, we love you guys so much. If Jesus Image has blessed you and you also want to give, you can text GIVE to the number on your screen. If you're in the room, you can text GIVE to the number on your screen. And we'll be back in just a moment.
We'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when people start coming for the sake of Jesus. And we'll know that a Jesus movement is upon us when we're more aware of Jesus than the movement. There's only salvation in Jesus. Says here, I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Nothing this world has to offer will ever satisfy your soul. Only Jesus will satisfy your soul. Jesus is so real. He's so near. the hero. He's the hero. Jesus is the hero. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that? There's one hero in this story. Amen. Can we all stand? I just want to worship for a moment. Let's just close our eyes, lift our hands to heaven. Oh, we love you, Lord Judy. Come stand right next to me. Why don't you lead us, Judy? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I have decided Let's sing that. to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No, no turning back. Sing that again. I've decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow. Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Sing that again. I, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Again, I've decided. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No time.
one hand on your heart, lift one hand to heaven. Lord, today we ask you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the name above every name, that the fire of the Holy Spirit would burn in us brightly, that our minds would be renewed according to your word, according to your presence, and that the word of God would dwell richly within us, and that the power of your word would go forth this morning, and that many, many would be born again, and that many would be set free from the evil one, that many would be set free from sickness and mental illness, that your miracle working power would flow all to glorify the name of Jesus. And so with both hands lifted this morning, we say thank you for the blood of the cross of Calvary. Thank you for the blood that flowed from your veins to give us access this morning to the throne of grace that we might come with boldness, your word says, and approach the throne of grace and we say thank you Jesus thank you Lord for your love speak clearly to us through your word this morning in Jesus name amen can we give the Lord praise thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you Lord let Judy know you love her would you Wonderful. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It's true, I, I am 45. I'll need ministry afterward. No. Quite the reality check. I don't feel 45. Yeah. Well, why don't we get in straight into the word? Oh, I... I um, I need to make one announcement. You know how I love them. Um, we need you to make, make sure that we are able to contact you this week because uh, something really wonderful may be happening as early as next Sunday morning. Okay. You need, you need to make sure that we can contact you. And that goes for all of you who are, are watching. Maybe you didn't make church this morning because you were too cozy. Uh, scan that QR code, please. Just trust me. We need to be able to get in touch with you. Uh, and be in prayer. Something really exciting seems to be just around the corner. We're about 98% there. Amen. So... Make sure you do that. I don't know how it can be more clear. There's an old saying, people are smart, crowds are a little slower. So, uh, also, um, uh, these next two Sunday nights are going to be very special. Tonight and actually next Sunday morning is gonna be very historic for our church. So I want you to make sure that you, you're here uh, you know we don't tell you who's coming and that's not to be mysterious, it's to build a church around and on the Lord, not on our favorite famous speaker, amen? Uh, it's very important and uh, that's the only way to really have longevity uh, in the kingdom. So next Sunday morning, or this tonight, next Sunday morning and next Sunday night are going to be amazing. So get there, if you've never been to a Sunday night, tonight and next week are the ones you, you, you really wanna be there. Uh, additionally, this week we have our, our first Pastors and Leaders Conference coming. And um, the great thing, yeah, the great thing about uh, Jesus School is that uh, we're allowing them to attend this year. And um, well, that's, that's what they're in training for, is to be leaders in, a, in the uh, assignment the Lord has given them, right? So I don't know, is there still time to register, David? Okay. I think we've got already including students, almost 1,500 people coming just for the Pastors and Leaders Conference, which is, I don't glory in that, I don't glory in numbers, but it does tell me that there's great hunger uh, around the world in the lives of leaders. Uh, many are tired and many are done with dry church and they want the presence of the Lord Jesus, they want to teach his word with clarity and they want their families to not be uh, sacrificed on the altar of ministry and it doesn't need to be. You don't need to lose your family to please the Lord, especially if he gave you family. He's the author of family. 
So this is going to be very, very special this week. And then, uh, as I said, uh, many of our friends are staying over. It's going to be an incredible two weeks together. So get there. Amen? How'd I do? Well, good? All right. I, I'm going to continue in our Friends of the Bridegroom teaching. Have you been enjoying it? I hope you have. Um, I'm going to quickly rip through. These are not... Um, I, I don't by any means claim to cover every quality that a friend of the bridegroom has with these eight qualities. There are many more. And I also want to say that they're not in a particular order of importance. Okay. But I just want to give you eight, and then I'll continue with these as well, and I'm going to give you some scriptural support, which is very important. Say amen. Uh, the first quality of a friend of the bridegroom is that they love Jesus and his presence. They love him. And I added his presence uh, because for some reason uh, some see a difference between the two. And there is no difference between the two any more than there would be a difference between the presence of Nathan and Kathleen and Nathan and Kathleen themselves. We're asking for the actual Nathan and Kathleen to be with us and dwell with us when we request their presence, right? So say this out loud, he is his presence. Is. Say this, his presence is him. Presence is him. The, actual him. the actual him. Now that's very, very important. That's very important. I thought you'd repeat that, but I'm proud of you. You didn't do it this time. <laughs> it's very important because some people agree with the Lord's bio, but not, they're not familiar with the Lord himself. And, and, and let, let me say this very clearly. There is a biblical, doctrinal, theological deficiency and train wreck right now in the body of Christ. An absolute train wreck. Now, we're going to, I don't think the day will ever come where we agree on every single thing. But there are some things you just have to get right. You cannot get Jesus wrong. <laughs> if you want to argue about the peripherals and this and that and pre-trib, post all this stuff, you want to do all that, okay. But you can't get Jesus wrong. We cannot get the infallibility of the scriptures wrong. Now they may be open to interpretation, but they are not open to our deconstruction and argument. They constructed us. It's quite hilarious. Man loves to deconstruct what he doesn't understand or has fallen away from. I remember Billy Graham said to a man, I think somebody said, explain God to me. He said, do you think ants are pretty smart? The guy goes, yeah, 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 they're pretty smart. Why do you say that? Well, they get in line, they can build cool little, whatever those are called, sand uh, hills with tunnels and all kinds of stuff and they're very orderly and they pass food from one another and they're quite intelligent for an animal of that size and uh, then he said well try teaching it algebra and he said a friend there's a greater chasm between you and God than between you between an ant and an algebra teacher we often try to tear down and deconstruct what we don't understand the scriptures the scriptures are God breathed the Bible says you can live your life on the word of God. In fact, Jesus told us to. Jesus said, do not build your life on shifting sand, but build your life, he said, on what I've spoken. So when the storm comes, your house is built on a bedrock and you will not move. And what I can attest to, especially over this last 18 months of my life, is that the word of God is stable, more stable than the heavens, the Bible says. It is more stable than the earth. Heaven and earth will pass away but my words, Jesus said, they will never, ever pass away. Amen? You can't get that stuff wrong. You got to get it right. Your eternity depends on it. Got to get it right. Got to get Jesus right. So number one, they love Jesus and his presence. Number two, they love the word of God. Say amen, talk to me a little. I know I usually don't do that, but 
I need the encouragement after turning 45. <laughs> Let's read, go to John chapter 17. You know, I've been tempted at times because I have this Bible, it's pretty bulky, to just walk up with my iPad because I can have a Bible in it. And lately I was like, no, no, a generation needs to see a Bible, a Bible at the pulpit. Don't we? Our children need to see us holding our Bible. Certainly we need to see Bibles in church, on the pulpit. John 17 Verse 17, this is Jesus speaking. And sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So what is truth? Say the word of God. Say it again. What is truth? So Jesus says here, sanctify them with your truth. How are we sanctified? And I've spoken about this before on Sunday morning. Sanctification is to be taken out from the darkness of the world the blindness of the world, the compromising nature, and the law of sin and death, all that lives in this darkness that the world is under. And I don't mean only people, I'm talking about this world system. We're removed from it. That is one half of the sanctification coin. But the second half of the coin is not only being taken out from, but being dedicated unto. Now if you grew up in a religious critical environment. You are a master at telling everybody why they're wrong. And there are entire movements and camps that are dedicated to pointing the finger as to why everyone is wrong. And in many cases, they're right. Those people are wrong. But when you have the wrong heart, you're wrong the whole time. I don't want to be known for pointing out what's wrong in everyone. Even though that's part of the ministry, it actually is. But remember what Jesus said, how can you see a speck when there's a plank in your own eye? I've discovered I'm too busy dealing with my plank than to create a ministry around your speck. And the anointing of the Spirit does not come upon us to merely point out what's wrong, though there's a time for that. I want to be very clear. The anointing of the Spirit comes upon us to preach the gospel. And I don't want my tombstone to say on it, gosh, he told everyone off. In fact, I just wanted to say Jesus on it. Under, not that Jesus is in that tomb. <laughs> or he loved Jesus, or Jesus loved him. I guess that'd be better, Jesus loved him. Are you following me? You don't, you don't want that, but you need to be wise in these days. You need to be wise in these days. But Jesus gave us the answer to knowing when a thief and robber comes. He basically said, my sheep are masters at my voice. They didn't get a masters in the thief and robber's voice. So I'm so addicted to the Lord's voice that every time I hear another, that's not him. But how can I say that's not him if I spend all my time focusing on what thieves and robbers sound like? There, there is a time to correct error. And if you've ever been to Jesus school, you've heard a lot of it. but you don't want the pulse of your life to be that. You want the pulse of your life to be Christ crucified. Be addicted. So, number one, they love Jesus and his presence. Number two, they love the word of God, and that is John 17, 17. Let me just visit this quickly before I go to number three. The, regarding this uh, statement, Jesus, this prayer Jesus prays, sanctify them with your truth. He's actually giving us the means by which God sanctifies us. So take them out of, he's, remember he's praying for his disciples, his followers. Take them out of this world, that's what the word is, and then dedicate them as holy vessels unto you. All right, which is a process. 
And what is the means by which he accomplishes that? Thy word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. What is the truth? Thy word is truth. Reading, digesting, and praying the scriptures is vital to living a life of Christ-likeness, which is another way of saying holiness, which is not a curse word. It's a wonderful thing. People who are free from sin are quite happy. Quite happy. Sin, habitual sin, is a doorway to depression and anxiety. It just beats you down. And Jesus said, he who sins is a slave to it. We don't want to be slaves, but love slaves, bond slaves. Number three. Friends of the bridegroom, well, let me, let me revisit one and two. They love Jesus and his presence. Number two, they love the word of God. Number three, they love his church. They love his church. Why do they love his church? Because his church is his bride. Imagine if you told a guy who's deeply in love with his wife, and let's just say you've been married for 2,000 years, you're, and you're aging, you're quite old at that point, okay. Let's just say you said, I love you, but her, she drives me nuts. My guess is he's not gonna appreciate that very much. Probably not gonna trust you as much. Probably not gonna want to hang out with you in his spare time or let you super close. If you want to find deep friendship with the bridegroom, you must learn to love his bride, even if they're a little different than you. Now here's the best part about it, is they all think you are different than them. fall in love with his bride, and there are multiple, multiple passages. I won't give you them all right now, I can. But the church is called the bride in the book of Revelation. Go find all these, they're there, I promise. We see the parable of the 10 virgins. It refers to them as the virgin bride. The entire book of the Song of Solomon is an allegory of Jesus and his church. I used to say type and shadow, but I see it differently, type and shadow speaks of a bit more hollow nature. An allegory is a hidden meaning within the text. It is the actual meaning. And the Shulamite here you see emerges as the bride who loves the bridegroom and whom the bridegroom comes looking for, listen, when it's wet outside. And he says to her through the door, open for me my love, open, my locks are wet with the dew of night. In other words, when the weather was bad out there, he wanted to talk to her. And he was willing to wait at the door until she opened. We see that in Revelation chapter three, Jesus knocking at the door and he says, if any man hear, hear and open, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Oh, that's fellowship. I said, that's fellowship. Number four, they love the lost. They love the lost. Unfortunately, I, I hear a tone at times, a tone. I'm not saying I've actually heard it just like this, but I certainly hear the tone, and it kind of sounds like it's uh, the church versus the lost. I, I, for the life of me, don't understand that. It is the church versus the world system, of course. But the Bible says he's, God is not willing, Jesus speaking of his Father, that any should perish. John 3.16 is proof that he loves the lost. For God so loved the world, and again, that word so is descriptive more than it's quantitative. It could be read like this. This is how God loved the world by sending his one and only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's not the church versus the lost. It's the church preaching the gospel and showing the love of Jesus to the lost. So number four, friends of the bridegroom love the lost. 
I'd like to add a, uh, just a little side note to that point, and that would be this. The church should not become like the lost to win the lost. There's a better way. <laughs> How do you win them if you become like them? When we were living in LA, this thing emerged or in LA. We lived in Orange County, which was much easier traffic-wise. This thing emerged in the ministry where preachers became known for the by how many famous influencers they could hang out with. So bizarre to me. And of course, a whole generation followed them on social media and it became like their claim to fame. This guy or girl is so-and-so's pastor. And what ended up happening, I watched it, I've watched it for 20 years, literally 20 years. In the lives of my friends, not, not people I don't know, these are friends that you would not, some of you wouldn't even know their name, most of them, you would not know their name. But they lived out in Orange County or LA. They started going to nightclubs and getting VIP booths to minister to the people that they were partying with. And you gave it like 18 months to two years and the next thing you know, their family gets blown up. The wife of the preacher's like, dude, I didn't marry you so you could be in the club every night. That was what you did before you got saved. Blew their marriage up. And in many cases, I'm talking many, left the ministry and in some cases left the faith. I had someone tell me recently, what are you so afraid of? Uh, you need to trust people to make the right decision. I said, that's true, but I don't trust the devil. Now, if the devil, listen, could put a wedge, listen to me carefully, if the devil could put a wedge between Adam and God, don't you think he could put a wedge between you and your destiny? I'm always amazed, I'm, 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 and part of me laughs on the inside. I'll hear preachers go, I ain't afraid of the devil. And I'm, I'm not saying you should be afraid of the devil. But I hear like a language and a verbiage and a vibe that comes from him. He's under my feet. I wish he'd walk through this door. I'd put him in a headlock, roundhouse him, he'd be out of here. Roundhouse, then headlock, I guess that'd be the, the, the more realistic progression. But when I hear this slightedness that actually Jude addresses in his epistle, towards powers of darkness, in my head I go, you have never faced off with a true spirit of darkness. You have no clue what you're talking about because if you did, it's the last thing you'd want to do right now. Now we should not be uh, afraid or intimidated of him. But I want to let you know very clearly, you make foolish decisions, it is not the Lord's fault. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate or be ye sanctified, be ye holy. Compromise, listen, compromise weakens you in your battle against the devil. So I want to be very clear. Yes, love the lost. But the greatest way to love the lost is to passionately burn in love with Jesus. And then allow his holy love to flow through you toward them. Getting hammered at night doesn't help that person come to Jesus, believe it or not. <laughs> Maybe the gospel would do a better job. All right. I hope you worship leaders are listening. Number five, friends of the bridegroom love family. They love family. They honor mother and father. 
They love their spouse. Beyond loving Jesus, their spouse is just everything to them. Friends of the bridegroom discover the great revelation of Jesus and his bride through their earthly marriage. And then uh, they allow the Holy Spirit to remind them of Peter's words. If you do not treat <laughs> your spouse correctly, God will not hear your prayer. It's an amazing revelation and keeps you repenting to God and each other. I once had a preacher tell me that they, uh, he did not want any children because he felt like it would slow down the ministry. And I love this person, but I said, go have a child and your heart will blow up in the love of God and give you an entirely new perspective of ministry. Or I, I can't spend time with my children because I'm busy in the ministry. See, that's what happens when you make witnessing more important than being a witness. The Bible doesn't say that the Holy Ghost will come upon us to merely witness. The Bible says that when the Holy Ghost comes upon us, we become witnesses. We embody the life and power of the resurrected Christ. And the longer I do this, listen, the longer I do this, so I've been full-time in the ministry since 2003, full-time. I preached my first message in 1994. I know, you're like, gosh, you are 45, yeah. That was my first message. We started with six people in my parents' school. They had a little Christian school with six people in that school, and that was my first crowd. And then in a few months, we had about, I don't know, a few hundred coming. And that began my love affair with preaching the gospel. But over the years, I have discovered, and I'm still discovering, the power of consistency. The power of doing a few things every day really well. And while somebody might go like this and become well known, and by the way, being well known does not, it does not mean the same thing as favor. It does not. That's allowing worldly metrics to become our own. Here's a question. Where did Jesus have a bigger crowd? Did he have a bigger crowd in Galilee when he was working miracles? or a bigger crowd on Calvary when he was dying? Which, which one? Okay. No, not Calvary. Galilee. He had a few. He had a crowd of enemies on Calvary. But we're talking about, in some cases, 15 to 20,000 people total just when he fed them. Which moment is more vital to our faith in eternal security? Calvary or the multiplication of food? Calvary. I'm grateful for what he did there. I'm grateful for the miracles. I'm grateful for the healing, but make no bones about it. Christ crucified and risen is the core and the full breadth of our faith. So was Calvary less successful than Galilee? No. Calvary plundered the underworld. Calvary shook the heavens. Calvary caused literally the rocks to explode and the earth to quake, and the sky to grow dark. Calvary purchased your soul. Calvary destroyed the claws of the devil. Every prince in power bowed its knee. Never had they seen such a sight. Could the God of the universe go so low? That's greatness. I said, that's greatness. That's greatness. That's what the church must embrace again. The crucified life is greatness. Lowliness is greatness. Humility is greatness. Jesus is the first martyr, not the first superhero. He's the first one to come and die and show us, listen, the perfect revelation of God. I want you to get that. 
I, I want you to see Calvary as being so much more than just something Jesus did. It is not just something he did. It is who he is. You've got to get that. Let Calvary begin to frame your revelation of who God is. This is a game changer. It will change our churches. America needs what I'm saying. It's very commonplace to the teaching and preaching of the gospel in the Middle East and the East. That's why you get around Brother Yoon, you're like, what is it on him? What is its godliness on him? It's the true character of Jesus, the true nature of Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. The Lamb. Lambs come to bleed. Lambs come to die. They give their life away. Are you following me? This is vital. It's, it's so important to get this because this would help you when you're sitting, uh, you're sitting at the table. Anybody have, uh, anybody have lost family members that are just a trip to sit down and eat with at a, at a holiday and they're just, the, well, raise your hand. And they make you laugh but make you nervous. <laughs> you know those? Anybody have family members who love to debate? All right. Well, here's one, deba- here's one uh, point of debate. If there's a God, why could there be suffering in the world? And the answer is very clearly, I don't know what God you're following. This is the tree of suffering. He didn't strap a sword to his back. He carried a cross naked up a hill. The greatest revelation of God the world has ever known. Christ and him crucified. And this is the core of family. The core of family is laying your life down for one another. (laughs) Let's just be honest. Does it not take decades to just move a foot forward relationally? In a, like you look at yourself, you go, I'm the same way I was 15 years ago in relationship to your spouse or however. And you want these things to go, right? You're like, I don't like that about me. I wish that would go. And when that's challenged, we, we defend ourselves. We defend the way we are. And what we're actually doing is making paramount our defense. And I think we would go much further if we made paramount humility. Lowliness. Amen? They love family first because, well, not before the Lord, but they understand the grand economy of God. And what I mean by that is God created family before he created ministries. And if you, if you are grasping for self-induced, self-created promotion, and you make a way for yourself, and you don't have what I'm talking about, all that you grasp for will eventually crush you. I've seen it. I mentioned this earlier. I've seen guys I started off with or knew years ago, and they would some would skyrocket, some wouldn't. The, 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 but then there was this, this consistency in some. They just did the same old thing over and over again because they had a different value system. If your value system is being known, you will do whatever you have to do to be known even if you go on a trip that God's not telling you to go on. If the voice of Jesus is success to you, if obedience is success, you will find his presence at the table with your family. And if he says go, you will have a grace on you to go that makes no sense to those who never go. It's obedience that matters. Say this out loud, I do not have to lose my family to please the Lord. 
God, say this, God, God. created family created. before he created ministry. I can, I can. and I will, I will. By, God's grace, by God's grace, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. in my family, and my assignment. Amen. Amen. Number six, they love to worship. Friends of the bridegroom love to worship. And that's Luke chapter 10, the great story of Mary of Bethany. There is Jesus sitting, and Mary's sitting at his feet, Well, let's just read it. You know when you read scripture, the reading of it alone is powerful. Luke 10, 38, this is probably, oh gosh, it's up there for me. It's one of my favorite portions of the whole Bible. House of Bethany was named after this passage. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village. A certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Those two go hand in hand, by the way. If you sit in his presence, you must love his word. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Oh, man, when he says it twice. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. Say one thing. And Mary has chosen that good part. Say this. Say, I must choose that one thing. You have to choose that. Mary has chosen that good part and it will not be taken away from her. Worship, hear me well, worship is never a waste of time. It came to me that somebody said once about our students, they just sit and worship all day. I'm thinking, well, We actually teach the Bible, but we've discovered how to worship and preach at the same time, and it's quite powerful. It's actually the biblical way. Paul said, I shared the gospel with you through my priestly ministry. That's another teaching. The devil is after busying you so that you forget to worship. because he wants you to be troubled about many things. Trouble and multiplicity are walk hand in hand. Have you ever been overwhelmed because you are just thinking about Jesus too much? (laughs) I'm just singing all day long and it's just such a burden. I just can't worship this much. I don't know what to do. It's just so stressful. I need counseling. Oh, it's wrong. I can't stop worshiping. I've never heard that. When someone's troubled, usually I'll say, what's up? And I get 15 things. We all do it. And the whole time the Lord's saying, one thing's needed. One thing's needed. One thing's needed. I'm right here. I haven't moved. Busyness deafens the heart. It just deafens the heart. And you can't hear the invitation. Until finally, eventually, the Lord waits on you to slow down, and he goes, I'm right here, I haven't moved. I haven't gone anywhere. It's never a waste of time to worship. Listen, it is the nature of the bride. She loves to worship. You say, well, what about the go? What about going out to preach? Of course, but she worships while she's doing it. And when you worship while you're working, he's actually working through you, and you don't lose your reward. If you do it the other way, you become an employee and then you gain a complex about yourself and your mighty ministry. And you start believing 
that the reason people get touched by Jesus is because your messages are so awesome. It is not by might. I said it is not by might. It's still not. Not by power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the greatest way to impact people while you're preaching the gospel is to have the heart connected to the Lord. Your heart can sing a song while you're walking them down the Romans road of salvation. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Number seven. Is all this okay? The, the friends of the bridegroom love the cross. They love his cross. Say this out loud. Say, Jesus, give me a greater revelation of your cross. Say it again. Jesus, give me a greater revelation of your cross. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, listen carefully, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad? but the one who is made sorrowful by me. Listen up, let me keep reading. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come I should have sorrow over those whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all. Oh, sorry, this is 2 Corinthians. I'm reading you 2 Corinthians, forgive me. I want you to hear the posture of, of Paul's heart. For out of, this is verse four, for out of much affliction, and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. Jess and I were talking about this yesterday, or it was three days ago. (laughs) Why Paul even had to write this letter? We see this amazing man, and then obviously 1 Corinthians 2 talks about him only knowing the cross. But we see this amazing man here in 2 Corinthians having to defend himself to people he loved. It's heartbreaking. He's almost having to prove himself to, listen, to people he birthed in the Lord. And he actually says that. You don't have many teachers. Or you don't have many fathers. You have teachers. But I birthed you in the gospel. If anyone could have said, I don't need to explain myself to you. Leave. It was Paul. But what in him, what in him would cause him to go, gosh, I've been beaten, shipwrecked, striped. I've worked with my hands. I never took anything from you. I'm jealous for you. I want you. You say I'm weak in words. In person, you say I'm weak, but that I'm only mighty from a distance. What would cause a father to actually open his heart in such a way? The life of the cross. Weakness. Meekness. I said this last week. The meek are promised the earth because God trusts the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, have you ever, uh, have, have you ever not been meek in an argument? Okay, what did you get from that? You won the argument, maybe. So congratulations, you won. And you'll forget about it in two days. You don't get a trophy for I won my argument with Aaron. You don't get a medal. But if you're meek, you get the earth in the age to come. Which one do you want? Do you want a pat on the back? Do you want to be right? Or do you want to be entrusted in the age to come? Do you know Paul tells the Corinthians, I cannot believe you're suing one another. Gosh, Christendom could learn something there. And he says, you you can't settle disputes. You have to go to the world to settle arguments. And I love this. I love what he says after that. Don't you know you're going to judge angels? I would have added, you bozos. You, you, 
You can't settle an argument and you're going to judge angels one day. What's he saying? You are supposed to be learning how to live in the age to come. And you're mad somebody stole two pounds of hummus for you, from you. And you're arguing over, oh, there's a bad business deal. And you go at it with one another and then you call in the world to, dis- to settle these disputes that are meant for the church. And what he's trying to say is, don't you realize the dispute itself is training? Go with it. And then he said, it's just better to be cheated. It's better to throw in the towel like a lamb. Then you gain lamb likeness or meekness. And then you're entrusted with the earth in the age to come. Amazing. I said amazing. So now if you go to 1 Corinthians 2, you're going to realize why Paul could even talk like this. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. He's saying, I didn't come as a great orator or a great communicator. For I determined not to know. It's interesting language. (laughs) I determined not to know something. Okay. I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. Now you're going to hear in verse 3 what we just read about in 2 Corinthians. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. God would rather you show up in weakness than an independence in natural strength and earthly strength or in pride come in weakness a gentle answer a gentle response turns away wrath I want you to notice that Paul determined to know nothing Accept Christ and him crucified. Hold on. That means that you must determine to know zero if you want the revelation of Christ crucified. If you don't see, listen, if you don't see in your Christian perspective Christ crucified, buried, and risen, it's not Christian. Throw it out. If you have all this, you have this massive Christian duffel bag which is what we, I mean, we have a pod at this point. Seriously, the church should own storage units of all this stuff that is more than peripheral. It's so fringe, I can't even, I don't even know what to call it. And it's all part of our Christian experience, our Christian language, our Christian culture, our verbiage, it's all part of it. And then someone comes around and goes, hey, you know this thing is about the Lord Jesus? And you go, Uh Uh-huh, that happened to me at the altar. I've moved on to deeper, more spiritual things like revival and the move of God. Uh Uh-huh, Jesus crucified and risen. I got that. It took me like five minutes. And I extracted all the nectar from the wonder of the crucified lamb, who, by the way, is the centerpiece of worship in heaven, but I got it all at the altar. And now I'm into the other stuff. Don't you find it amazing that Paul explains the spiritual gifts to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians? He goes in detail explaining it all, and then he finally comes to chapter 15, and he says, and now let me remind you of the gospel I preached to you, that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised according to the scriptures. Why do you think he said that? He did not want them to get tripped up on the work of the ministry and the gifts of the spirit, though he told them to earnestly desire them. He still brought them back to everything which is Christ and him crucified. Amen? So number seven, they love his cross. Lastly, lastly, I led perfectly into this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We can trust him. They love his death, burial, and resurrection. 
They love his death, burial, and resurrection. Say that. Death, burial, and resurrection. Say it again. Death, burial, resurrection. And that's 1 Corinthians 15. I've read it to you before, but let's read it one more time. Then we'll receive communion. And we'll dismiss. How's, is this helping you? Moreover, brethren, <laughs> I love that. Moreover, brethren, he's like, let's, let's get this straight here. I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand. Let me stop there. The tragic indictment of many of our circles in the church is that we have relegated the preaching of the gospel to the moment of the altar call. Forfeiting our power. And we've substituted the glory of the Father's only sermon for self help motivational topical series that we actually plan out a year in advance. And we craft those series around your taste buds. What do they like? What do the people want? What do they respond to? How do I choose my guest speaker? Well, I guess I'll choose the guest speaker who gets the biggest turnout. Where do I get the best feedback? What message do I preach that gives me the most views and downloads? And without knowing it, you share this with your staff and that becomes your staff-wide conversations. We're gonna hit it this, this week <laughs> in a very loving, healthy way. And then the next thing you know, your staff, without knowing, is doing everything to make people happy. Weakening their souls in the hour where our souls need to be the strongest. Do you realize we are in the 11th hour? You can't hunt elephants with BB guns. Come on. I remember this guy was saying, I'm storing 22 uh, shells and uh, canned goods. It's like three years ago. Him and all his buddies were doing it. A friend of mine goes, wait, what, what size rounds are you storing? It was 22. And he's like, and, uh, and who, who do you think you're going to shoot with that? He goes, and he named a specific army. He's like, these army, they're going to come and they're going to do this and that. And he goes, uh, if that army comes, they're dropping bombs. Your 22 is going to do nothing. It's going to ricochet off anything you shoot at except flesh, he goes, but you're not shooting a 22 at a fighter jet. And that's what's happening in the church. If you can describe messages and your view of Christianity is not rooted and grounded and full of and pulsating, pulsating and bleeding out Christ crucified and risen, you are not bleeding Christianity. You're just not. Now you might be into spiritualism, motivationalism with some moralism mixed in, and you might be super encouraging, and you might be coaching people along. There's a time to help and coach people. I'm not, I'm not knocking on that, but I just want to be really clear. We stand on Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, risen, exalted, and returning. That's, that's what we do. And Paul says here, uh, I have, I'm going to share this with you because I preached it to you. You received it then. Look at verse 1. And it's this by which you stand. 
So the gospel doesn't get me saved only. It is the gospel, the revelation of Jesus that causes me to stand in my Christian life, not merely invite me into my Christian life. By which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, Kepha is another way to say it, Kepha. Then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 men at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present. But some have fallen asleep. And after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. I love this, this verse right here. Then last of all he was seen by me, <laughs> as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, whom not wor who is not worthy to even be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. I love that he said, I'm not even worthy to be called one. But I labored more abundantly than all of them. Yet not I, and this is the secret, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Would you bow your head and just close your eyes for a moment? And really, every eye closed, nobody moving. I want to call everyone in bondage this morning to Jesus. I want to call everyone who's been living a double life, a secret life, a life of Christianity by name, but not when the door is closed. I'm calling those who don't have control over their bodies those who've been given over to lust and porn and hatred, darkness and sin. You can't control your tongue. You refuse to forgive. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. I want to call you this morning to the one who will set you free the one who has promised to set you free, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. I want to talk to those right now who once walked with Jesus so closely. And maybe you were hurt and wounded and you became offended and you got stuck in that offense. And you miss his touch, you miss his word, you miss his presence. You miss the joy and the liberty that comes with walking with Jesus. If I'm speaking to anybody here and you feel that witness of the Holy Spirit, I just want you to quickly put your hand up and put it back down. Thank you, Father. I'd like everyone to stand. If you raised your hand or you really wish you did and you didn't have the courage to raise your hand before and you say, I, I do now, I want you to get out of your seat and come down. Like Billy Graham used to say, Jesus died publicly. And he calls us to come to him publicly. So many of your hands went up. Step out into the aisle and just come. Come publicly. Come publicly. Thank you, Lord. Come publicly and experience the mercy and the grace of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
If you brought someone today and you know they need the Lord, I want you to turn, turn to them and say, hey, come on, let's go. Let's go. You, you do that. You do that work. Thank you, Lord. This is beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give the Lord praise one more time? Ruth, Dion, would y'all come? This is wonderful. Can we just lift our hands and thank the Lord? I want us to all pray out loud. And for those of you who came forward, the Lord knows. He knows you. I was listening to this this morning in my audio Bible, that the Father knows when a single sparrow falls to the ground. <laughs> what a caring Father. He loves you and he knew you before you were ever born. And this morning, every sin you confess according to the word of God and that you repent from, he will wash away. Joe and Amy, would you come and pray with these two precious ones here? Let's pray out loud in faith, knowing he's listening. Heavenly Father, I have sinned against you and I confess my sin. Forgive my sin. Wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. Cleanse my soul. Make me new. Father, I repent today. I turn from this world. I turn from my sin. I turn from the devil himself. And I turn to you, Holy Lord. Fully, I put my trust in Christ and Him crucified. Jesus, I want to walk with you now. Fill me with your spirit. And I declare that you died and that you were raised from the dead. And I declare that you are the Son of God perfect in all your ways and you are coming back again to rule and reign this morning I hand my life to you as I receive your life in Jesus mighty name Jesus Christ is Lord Oh, I love that. Say that again. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, for those of you who came forward, I would like them all, we're all going to receive communion. I would like them all to have their elements. Can we get those to them? I want them to receive communion right here. Take your elements, would you please? I need some too. I felt this strongly, this is for those in their seats. I want you to ask the Lord just to release you from judgment, from being judgmental. All of us should ask that. Lord, don't ever let us be. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. Why don't we just say that together? Lift our hands. Say, Father, protect us from judgment. Forgive us if we've judged. We don't want to be judged. Forgive us and help us with the plank in our own eye. In Jesus' name. Let's take the bread. Is there anything more beautiful than seeing people at the altar receive communion? Thank you, Lord. What a gift. Oh, Holy Spirit come upon this moment as we receive your precious body and blood, Jesus. Lift the bread. The word of God says, is the bread not the body of the Lord? Is the bread we bless not the body of the Lord? Is the bread we break not the body of the Lord? 
Jesus, you said this was my body, broken for you. Take and eat it, do it often, in remembrance of me. And so as we break this together, let's break that. We remember your body being torn. When they beat you in Gethsemane and slapped you in Caiaphas' court. When they tore your skin off your back at the whipping post, when they nailed your hands and your feet, speared your side and put the crown of thorns on your head and pulled the precious beard from your holy face. They tore you that we would be one with you and one with each other. And holy bread of life, that's what you said of yourself. I am the bread who comes down from heaven that precious bread torn to feed many. Feed us now with yourself. O heavenly shepherd, feed us with thyself. Receive the bread of the covenant, the body of the Lord Jesus, and be healed in Jesus' name. Receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's lift the cup. Oh, blessed Lord. He's so near, friends, so near. Lord, we lift the cup. You said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And the blood bears witness. The blood speaks a better word. The blood speaks righteous. The blood speaks my own. That's what you say over us. The blood speaks protected. The blood speaks washed and redeemed and purchased. Now, Father, as we receive the precious blood of Jesus, cleanse us, forgive us, protect us, in Jesus' mighty name, us and our families, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prayer team, come forward one more time and just surround these precious people at the altar. Everyone lift your hands to heaven that I can just pray a blessing over you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray your blessing upon your people, those in this room and those watching around the world. Let the tangible grace of the Holy Spirit grow and increase upon us. Let the weighty touch of the Spirit be our portion, that we would walk in fellowship and union with the precious person of the Holy Spirit. Rest upon your people today, I pray, tangibly. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Can we lift one more praise to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. God bless all of you who came forward. Our team is here to help you. We have a table out front. We would love to see you there. Can we give the Lord one more shot of praise? This is wonderful. I'll see you tonight. See you tonight. Doors open at 5. Service starts at 6. God bless you. God bless you. Hey everyone, Michael and Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. A local church, Jesus School, a House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing, will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just wanna say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving, thank you for praying, thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations 
will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that, we believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we wanna invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is gonna do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10:42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary, 
What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.